Hello, this is Jane Stavum, Superintendent of the Sioux Falls School District, and this is our podcast. Join us for an audible look inside the Sioux Falls School District, where we'll put a spotlight on the people, places, and practices of our district. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our podcast. I'm Jane Stavum, Superintendent, and with me today is one of our newest additions to IPC, Dave Osterquist, who is the security coordinator. Hello. Hello. Thanks for being with me. Thank and you for I having had me. to ask you what your title was because I had to remember your official role, but I know what you do and why you're here. And so um, you've had about six months now in your new position. And one of the reasons why we asked you to um, step into this role is because of your expertise. And um, what we want to do as a district is go deeper in our practices and in our efforts to be a safe place as much as possible. So let's re remind our audience just a little bit of your background. And I want to go way back. What would you say is your very first role that was related to safety and security? Was it as a police officer? Was there something before that? Were you like hall monitor or I'm really safety not sure. kid in fifth grade? Honestly, Dr. Stavum, I'm not <laughs> sure how I feel about you using the phrase way back. It's pretty far. But that being you're said, about my age. <laughs> we're, we're close, I would suspect. Um, I would think that probably my first role in safety and security would have been as a crossing guard in elementary school. Mm and moving into several years later probably because those middle school high school years there wasn't much going on there but in college i was at the university of northern iowa and i was part of the department of public safety there doing some of their parking patrol and parking enforcement um, after college i was in the military as a military policeman so my whole life has been about the law law enforcement security those kinds of things then coming out of college, I uh, applied for the Sioux Falls Police Department and started there in 1993. That's great. You can tell that you had a mind that was concerned about boundaries and safety and people doing the right thing. And you are somebody who exemplifies that, I know, from your daily work and the ways that you show that and model that every day. It's been a, a great addition to our work. But as you've come through that, history of law enforcement, there has to be some things that you've seen change over time. What do you think is different now in terms of school safety and security? What's the starkest difference between now and maybe five years ago even? Let's go back a little bit. I think that answer is pretty obvious to everyone. It was the huge change in people's mental well-being post-COVID. That was a very impactful event for our students, for our staff, for everyone. And it has taken some time for us to refocus our energies on the things from a security and safety perspective that were important to us pre-COVID because our perspectives changed, our outlooks changed. And now, even though we may not be back to what we would call quote unquote normal, things are feeling more normal than they were. And you can see that shift. You can see people coming back to like, okay, the pandemic was scary for me. Now I can move back to things that were important to me before that. Mm -hmm. There's a shift. And I think the ever present thing that's always um, on our minds to you know, some degree is just that big incident, whether it's a shooting or even some natural disasters kinds of things that we've seen happen in other places. And yet, um, nobody wants to see a school turn into a prison-like existence. And so right. how do we know where that line is? How do we know what is safe enough? I think that's dependent on the community, honestly. This year, I have established both a staff advisory committee and a parent guardian advisory committee and to sit down with staff members to sit down with parents and guardians of our students and listen to them tell me what they want to see change what they think where they think that line is that's important for us moving forward as district district leadership to be able to say we've talked with the community members that are part of our district 
and they believe this is where we should be. And I think that's ultimately how you make that decision is assessing the community, evaluating their perspectives, and then implementing their thoughts on those issues. Mm -hmm. Some of it's just the reality of what we can reasonably put in place with assurance. And so sometimes people will say, well, why don't we have metal detectors for getting in all of our games? Well, when you think about the number of doorways and places where people come in and out of just a basketball gym, Mm -hmm. that's different than one door in past Mm -hmm. people with metal wands going into a, let's just say a professional or a college game. And even then, we know those aren't foolproof. If I really wanted to sneak into Mm -hmm. uh, a college game or something out at the arena, I could probably do that. It might be a little harder. But that's one of the areas where we have to continually think about that and what are other ways that we can promote safety for those public events without everybody having to go through a checkpoint. So it's interesting that you bring up metal detectors because that very topic came up in both of those meetings. And while there is support for that concept from our community, I will say this, the the thing that came out of that conversation was it can't be the only thing. And I was very interested to hear people say that because Coming up, we're going to be implementing a threat assessment protocol. We have implemented these multi-tiered systems of support and positive behavior intervention strategies and all of these things coming in on the front end to deal with what is causing this behavior in the first place and what can we do to redirect that behavior, to teach coping skills, to teach uh, replacement behaviors so that students aren't... That will carry far more weight for the safety and security of our schools than putting up metal detectors in every building. I'm not saying I'm opposed to metal detectors. I'm only saying there's something more to it than that. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, think about a hard question. I'm going to give you a hard question. When we think about crime, we think about um, violence and those things that are a little on the scarier side, I believe that we are living in an age where our children are overexposed to violence through gaming, television, online. Do you think that's true or do you think that doesn't affect children? I believe there's research to show that it does. And you can go out and look that up for yourself if you disagree and that's that's fine. But thinking back to when I was a kid, the most violent things I were was exposed to would have been my favorite cartoon characters dropping cartoon anvils on each other's heads. And there were adults in that day and age that said, this is too much violence for our kids. So that mantra hasn't changed. It's been the same throughout history. However, I will say that I believe the violence has become more gratuitous. It has become more prolific. And there have to be boundaries And if I was going to make some advice or offer some advice for parents about violence, you need to know what your kids are watching both online, Mm -hmm. on TV, in the movies, because there's research to show that until you reach a certain age, you can't distinguish reality from what you're seeing on TV. And for you, it's the same thing up until a certain age. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember the age or I'd quote it, but of course that's gone when I want it to come back to me right now. about nine. Eight or nine. There we go. See, I knew you would know. Mm-hmm. So before that, there should be zero access to online video, whatever, violent video game violence, mm-hmm. anything. And then even at certain ages, it needs to be restricted and limited. But yes, I agree Which with you. Which no is no small feat. No, and not I at said, all. I um, you know, my children are 26 and 31. I am past the point of having to parent in that way. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad because that ever-presentness you may be watching a particular show that's G or PG on TV mm-hmm. and the commercials for something else Absolutely. come on and are disturbingly different from the content of the show that you might be yeah. watching. And My kids are similar in age to yours, 27 and 25 now. And the advent of the YouTuber, the advent of what has now become TikTok, there used to be Vines back in my son's <laughs> day. 
but he was limited and Mm -hmm. we had to purpose to do that as parents i wish i could tell you it was easy but it wasn't it was a very difficult thing and there were times where i'd I'm like, something's not right. I just heard something coming from, and I'm getting up in the middle of the night. And I'm like, what are you doing? No, get it out of your bed. Get it out from under the covers, whatever. Yep. It's hard. I wish, I wish I could say parenting was easy, but it's not. Parenting is not. And I think parenting in an age to where school violence has become mm-hmm. the norm. We now have a generation of children going to school who have never known a time where they didn't understand what a school shooting is and have seen it on TV. I was talking to some of our new newer teachers about this just a little bit ago. The first lockdown drill in the city of Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls School District, was held in 2002. I know because I held it. Hmm. It was at Axtell Park Middle School. It was the first one ever done. So if you do that math, we're now 21 years into the fact of when we started doing these things in the city. So you think about the the students that are graduating from college now that are becoming teachers, all of them have grown up in a world where they have practiced mm-hmm. these things. They understand how they work. So it's I'm not 100% sure that it's a, a good thing, but I'm reading some different materials right now about violence, how to prevent violence, and then the best practices for lockdown drills, mm-hmm. which I think in Sioux Falls we perform those with best practices in mind mm-hmm. with the with a trauma informed approach with the best interests of our students and staff in mind other districts have not done that mm-hmm. and have reaped some very negative repercussions from right. that so well and I'm glad you um, mentioned just best practices because I think the other danger is um, equating school safety and school shootings as being the only thing. And there are so sure. many things that go into daily safety, mm-hmm. whether it be in school or in an office setting or just anywhere now. And and part of that is prevention. And mm-hmm. part of that is just being um, using some common sense about watching for things that look out of the norm or looking for things. Is, is there a door open or Have we secured things in a reasonable way, and are we consistent with that? So I think our goal as a district is to try to be very proactive, but also very reasonable, but diligent about the things that we are doing, which is why you've come on board. And I've I've always told people, even when I was serving as a law enforcement officer prior to coming to the district, what, five and a half years ago now, it's never wrong to say something looks out of place. And it's, you should never feel as if you're being a burden, as if you're being a problem when you say, hey, this doesn't look right to me. Because there are people that get paid money to check into those kinds of things and go, okay, it wasn't anything, but thank you for letting me know. Mm-hmm. Or it really was something, and I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Yeah. And that's how we've solved a lot of things. And so mm-hmm. we want to encourage people. We have that phrase out there, see something, say something. And people have a way of doing that through our Let's Talk button on the website, Absolutely. make a phone call to you. We have email, we have uh, building leaders, mm-hmm. all of those people know the right protocols to go through when something small or large happens that they want us to be aware of and we appreciate that. And I think that's the other piece is I'm so glad that you have those advisories set up because we can't do this without the eyes and the ears and kind of all joining hands across our community to do this. And that's also the message that we send at the beginning of this school Mm -hmm. year. Our mayor, our police chief, our school district folks, we were all part of that um, video. If you didn't get a chance to watch that, go back and grab that from the beginning of the year because it's a partnership. And we have a lot of good neighbors and um, people looking out for kids across the city and we do that collectively, and that's how we hope to keep walking forward without um, any major incidents happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, it's an important role. It's one that's been really interesting to watch over time. I was a, a newer principal when you talk about those first lockdown drills, and I remember having to do those for the first time, and um, how that must have looked and felt by children. And I always have to go back to that. What is it like to experience this as a second grader? Mm -hmm. You know, what would that have felt like? I I remember, um, you know, doing tornado drills. And even though I knew they were a drill, I hated it, number one, because we all had to, you know, sit in the position for what seemed like hours and was probably only about five minutes. But I can also always remember having in the back of my mind, what if this is real? 
-hmm. and just a little bit of uncertainty. And then you would go out and go back to class and everything would be okay. We know how children process things and you're right, they're trying to discern between, is this real or is this not real? And so it's that fine line of preparing kids to know also how to respond in these scenarios while yeah. also remembering their children. Elementary teachers have taught me more about preparing for preparing students for lockdown mm -hmm. drills than any other grade level. And that's not to minimize the role of middle school or high school teachers at all. But when I first started teaching and talking about lockdown drills and I'm traveling the state and talking to different agencies and different school districts, elementary teachers would ask me questions that I was completely unprepared to answer which as a law enforcement officer, that should have been expected. And then I would say, well, how would you do it? And we would talk through this. They're the ones that taught me about having a preparedness kit for elementary in a closet to include snacks, water, um, maybe some other issues that you might need to address right. with maybe a five gallon bucket in there if you get where yeah. I'm going with this. And they're the ones that taught me that. And they're now learning that. There are teachers here in our district that have implemented that same process and practice. And when we do drills now and you walk by an elementary classroom and the teacher has all the kids huddled in the corner and they're quiet and they're out of sight and they're sitting there snacking on fruit snacks or something else. That's amazing. And I love that. And it's about that muscle memory. It's not about frightening the kids. It's not about trying mm -hmm. to prepare them to, to fight a, a, a weird battle or anything like that. It, it's preparing them to do, oh, we're doing this, so we're going to go over here and eat fruit snacks. That's great. Let's do that all the time. Yeah. I think most people will respond well to fruit snacks. Maybe I would. we should have that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that was primary purpose of you is making sure that everyone in our district knows what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and what's going to be the process. And so we just keep trying to get better and better. Yeah. And I think you're playing a great role in that. If you were Thank to give you. one piece of advice to parents in terms of how they talk with their children about staying safe, both at school and in the community and at home, what's your best piece of advice? It's a hard thing to talk to younger kids about, but it's a term that I believe everybody should be, and it's called situational awareness. Just know what's going on around you. And for kids, you can phrase it in language that is appropriate for them. Hey, when you're walking home, let's not be staring at your phone. Let's be paying attention to what's going on around you. When you're out on the playground, let's be looking around. You know, if somebody walks onto the playground and you don't know them and it makes you uncomfortable, either leave or tell somebody. You don't have to stick around. Just when we talked about earlier about the violence and video games and that kind of, I think that's one of the things that is crazy if you remember the whole pokemon go thing I from do. a few years ago my wife and i were actually attending a conference at disneyland in california and i cannot count the number of times that a small person ran smack dab into me mm -hmm. because they were staring at their phone playing that particular mm -hmm. game and it's not just that game it's being involved in a video it's having your earbuds in and not paying any attention to what's going mm -hmm. on around you i told you my son and my kids were limited he was required to only have one earbud in. He could not put both of them in if he was in our house because he needed to be able to hear what his parents were saying to mm -hmm. him. So tell them to, to pay attention to what's going on around them, to let you know as mm -hmm. their parents or their guardians if there's something that made them uncomfortable and open those lines of communication with your kids. Yeah. Your teenagers are going to give you the, yep, fine, okay, yeah, whatever, but keep talking to them because now mm -hmm. that our kids are adults, you probably realize... They talk to you more. I promise it changes. Yeah. And they do listen to what you say occasionally. They bring occasionally. it back to you. Absolutely. I think your advice is well taken as well as good advice for parents. Oh, yeah. Take out your earbuds. Absolutely. Look up from your phone. Yes. And talk with your children and yes. notice what's going on. Absolutely. Good advice. Thank you for coming uh, to your new role. Thank you for being such a great resource to us. And I we hope it. that if people have questions or want to know more about school safety, check out our website or give us Absolutely. a call. Please reach out.